So, Austin, you're saying that claims of religious conscience, along with claims of secular moral conscience, should be allowed in the public square, even encouraged in public discourse. But isn't this only going to lead to more divisiveness, more civil strife? I mean, what happens when someone advances a public policy position for ending the right to abortion, for instance, or another culture war question, and uses religious reasons that aren't open to everyone Understanding them, religious reasons like God says abortion is wrong or God says uh, gay marriage is wrong because homosexuality is wrong. The first thing to say, as I said before, is that we have no choice. Religious liberty includes the liberty to speak one's mind in public, uh, even if people don't agree with you. What else could it mean? But I want to point out that the secular moral conscience and moral reasons can be as contested, as controversial, and no less divisive than than their religious counterparts. I mean, think about the controversies over globalization or immigration or race relations in this country. These aren't religious disputes. These are moral and empirical and legal disputes. Hmm. And even issues like abortion have great debates within the secular community. There are secularists who are for a woman's right to choose abortion and secularists who are against it. Sure, there are there are plenty of uh, of secular opponents of abortion. There are plenty of uh, secular opponents of physician assisted suicide. So, um, you know, uh, religious reasons don't have a, a lock on um, on public um, divisiveness. Hmm. On that last point, Austin, uh, the argument has gone that secular reasons are different from religious reasons in that religious reasons are essentially subjective. Religious reasons for morality are inherently subjective. They're not based on objective, testable, shareable evidence. They're based instead on things like revelation, on faith, on God told me so. So isn't that a good reason for privileging secular arguments in public discourse over uh, religious arguments? Isn't that why we're justified as secular liberals uh, to discount religious reasons in public discourse? Mm. Many have said so. Many prominent um, you know, liberal philosophers have said so for that reason. But I think it's just a mistake. Um, Religion has been called a conversation stopper, but you know it takes two to converse, and the decision about whether to stop the conversation lies as much with the secular liberal as the religious person. The fact that a claim originates in a subjective or personal experience that you don't share doesn't mean that you can't criticize that claim. I mean, if you've ever comforted a child who had a nightmare, you know this. Um, you say, it wasn't real. But how could you know that if you didn't have the experience? I mean, you might have an irrational fear of of flying, but others can talk to you about it rationally. Um, Well, all of that sounds gloriously condescending. You know, you're talking about irrational fear of flying or a child's nightmare that wasn't real and comparing it to a person's subjective religious reasons for having this or that moral position. You're basically saying open the floodgates, let religion into the public square and hope like hell that everyone sees through it, criticizes it and then discards it. Right. I think there's there's no condescension. The condescension uh, rests with the, with the person who doesn't take the serious public claims of others seriously. I, I think the same the the exact same reasoning applies to uh, claims of religious revelation. And by the way, um, many many claims of the religious in politics um, have nothing to do on at least on their own account with revelation. For example. The Catholic natural law tradition is supposed to give us access to moral truths, which, which are open to all, through really through secular reason. So it's it's just empirically false that every religious claim in in politics is a claim based on revelation. That's mm. just empirically false. But even those that are based on revelation can be and are must be criticized. I mean, if somebody tells you that that God has told you to, you know, murder your parents, we don't just accept that. We say, don't do it. <laughs> we, we, we can criticize claims um, as immoral. We can criticize them as impracticable, as, as illegal, um, regardless of their source. Hmm. Will this open up the floodgates? 
um, again, we have no responsible alternatives. But I think that our confidence can be can be buoyed by our history. After all, um, we did not escape the cauldron of actual religious war. Forget about impolite conversation, but the actual religious war was not escaped in the history of the West by privatizing conscience in the sense that contemporary liberals mean it. After all, the leading arguments for secularism in the West, as I discuss in, in a chapter on Spinoza um, and, and others, the leading arguments for secularism were, in a certain sense, religious arguments. The dissident Protestants who, who first popularized the idea of, of, t- of religious toleration in the West were making arguments from the Bible. Spinoza did likewise in his great book, The Political Theological Treatise, but he also pioneered um, an argument, which I call the argument from futility, which said that the attempt to coerce belief um, would be futile and self-defeating because belief is just not the kind of thing that can be forced. It must flow freely from one's own assessment of the evidence. Um, Madison picks this up and says that um, you know coerced belief would not be pleasing unto God. So here the idea is... Um, it's an argument for secularism based on a particular model of salvation. Hmm. To get a copy of The Secular Conscience, the book Sam Harris calls an extraordinarily lucid and a helpful book, uh, you can go to our website, pointofinquiry.org. Austin, most secularists, as we've discussed, see conscience, these moral reasonings, uh, well, that they should remain private. But you argue that there's a better way, uh, rather than arguing that you know, your personal beliefs should remain private. There's a better way to see it. And that's to understand secular liberalism, uh, that it's based not on the idea of conscience as being private, but on the idea that conscience is open. What does it mean for you to have a conscience that's open? I mean, open as in the open society. Think of the press or the media. In a free society, we protect the press from autocratic control by government or other powerful institutions. The press is to be autonomous. But we don't therefore say that it's private. The press is protected. It's left free and open, not so that it may be private, but so that it may serve a vital public purpose. And I say conscience is protected in order that it may pursue through conversation our vital questions of meaning, identity, value, and truth, uh, both in and out of the public square. This, by the way, has always been the the liberal tradition. Um, Secular liberalism wasn't always about stopping conversations. It used to be about starting them. Um, Spinoza was exiled from the Jewish community of of Amsterdam when he wrote his his masterpiece on on politics, and he hoped that uh, it would convince um, people to open their society to permit the discussion of the kinds of revolutionary ideas he was proposing. John Stuart Mill um, advocates a free society so that people may pursue what he calls experiments in living and share the results of those with each other in hopes of discovering um, the best and, and most worthwhile forms of human life. 